Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And, and welcome to the beautiful Lucas Theater. This is just a tremendous place, and I hope you enjoy it as much as we have had working with the people that are here. Uh, welcome to the opening night of the 12th Annual Savannah Book Festival, presented by Georgia Power, David and Nancy Cintron, the Sheehan Family Foundation, Mark and Patty, Pat Suen, and the Philip E. and Nancy B. Beekman Foundation. My name is Bo Anders, and I'm the president of the Savannah Festival Board of Directors. On behalf of my fellow board members, generous sponsors, and the many volunteers who help make this festival a reality every year, I'm delighted to welcome you here for our opening address with George and Paula Saunders. We were sad that Daniel Krauthammer had to reschedule his appearance as tomorrow night's keynote due to a family emergency. I want to personally thank Chris Steyerwalt for stepping up to deliver the keynote address with three days notice. Please join us tomorrow evening to hear Chris's entertaining take on the history of populism and where we go from here. Also, please hold on your tickets for tomorrow night's keynote address. I'm pleased to announce that Daniel has rescheduled for Monday, March 11th at 6 p.m. here in the Lucas Theater. Your original keynote address ticket will also be honored for the entrance to the March 11th event. We're thrilled that Daniel was able to reschedule his visit to Savannah, and please go to our website for more information. Before this evening's address, we hosted a reception to honor our literati members who are the foundation of the Savannah Book Festival. For the past 12 years, literati members from across our community and across the country have faithfully supported our important mission of celebrating the written word in Savannah. Would all the literati members present please stand up? <laughs> Thank you so much. I also want to recognize the Courtney Knight Gaines Foundation as the generous sponsors of our headline authors, George and Paula Saunders. Thank you for making tonight possible. The festival is fortunate to have special volunteers helping this evening, book lovers just like you. They're serving as your ushers upstairs and down here, downstairs here at the Lucas. Please join me in giving a round of applause for members of the Southbridge Book Lovers Circle Two. The Monday Book Club, Lit in the Afternoon, and Reading Between the Wine Book Clubs. <laughs> and a very special thank you to the 33 authors who have arrived a day early this year to participate in SBF at schools. Through this program, festival authors will visit public and private middle and high schools and universities in our community giving Savannah students a chance to interact with nationally recognized and prize-winning authors, sharing their early educational experiences, influences, and successes in their writing lives. We're also excited to host... Yeah. We are also excited to host, for the first time, the SBF Children's Tent which is co-sponsored with the Live Oak Public Libraries and the Library Foundation on Sunday from one to four. This is a brand new endeavor for us and we look forward to working with the libraries. If you haven't already, be sure to pick up a copy of Do Savannah inside today's edition of the Savannah Morning News. The editors of Do have created a ha handy pullout section that serves a very useful, friendly guide for the festival. We also encourage you to download the wonderful Savannah Book Festival app for GPS guidance, author and venue uh, info, and a listing of the delicious festival food. If you haven't already, please look in your program for information on downloading it to your phone. One schedule note for all of you would-be authors in the audience. Do we have any would-be authors in the audience? <laughs> I'm sure we do. We always do. Rick Richter, a partner in Adivis Creative Management, one of the nation's top literary agencies, will be in conversation with Jack Romanos, 
former CEO of Simon & Schuster, on Saturday afternoon at 1.40, on stage at the Jepson Nieces Auditorium, discussing the current world of book publishing. Now, a couple of housekeeping notes. Please take this moment to turn off your cell phones. I just heard one. <laughs> and we also ask that you do not use flash photography. For the Q&A portion, we ask that you raise your hand, and one of our volunteers will find you with a microphone. Please limit yourself to one question and no stories. <laughs> and immediately following their presentation, George and Paula will be signing festival purchase copies of the books. A numbered signing card provided by our booksellers from Ex Libris secures your place in line, which will be down here and up the aisle. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Heather Henley, the daily content editor of the Savannah Morning News and former editor of Do Savannah, who will introduce this evening's speakers. Please welcome Heather. Good evening. Tonight we're in for a very special treat, as this is only about the second time George and Paula Saunders have presented jointly in this manner. And as George put it this week in an interview with Do Savannah, it's a literary sunny and share. <laughs> this is also the couple's first trip to Savannah, and we're so fortunate they decided to spend this special night here with us in the beautiful Lucas Theater. George Saunders is the winner of the 2017 Man Booker Prize with his first novel, a New York Times number one bestseller, Lincoln in the Bardo. And he has recently, yes, I know. And he's also recently published Fox 8. He is also the author of the New York Times bestsellers, Congratulations, by the way, and 10th of December, an essay collection which was a finalist for the National Book Award and won the inaugural Folio Prize. He's received MacArthur and Guggenheim Fellowships and the Penn Malamud Prize for Excellence in the Short Story. And he was named, he was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2013, he was named one of the world's 100 most influential people by Time Magazine. He teaches in the creative writing program at Syracuse University. Paula Saunders grew up in Rapid City, South Dakota. She's a graduate of the Syracuse University Creative Writing Program and she was awarded a postgraduate Albert Schweitzer Fellowship in the Humanities at the State University of New York at Albany, where she spent two years studying under then Schweitzer chair, Toni Morrison. Her debut novel, A Distance Home, was released this past summer. <laughs> SCAD professor, SBF board member, and novelist Jonathan Rabb will be moderating this evening's conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce George and Paula Saunders. Happy Valentine's Day. Good evening. It's a pleasure uh, to be on the stage uh, tonight with Paula Saunders and George Saunders. Uh, this is a bit of a departure for uh, the book festival. Uh, this is the first time we have ever had a married couple in conversation. And I think it's... <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> and I think it's only appropriate since it's Valentine's Day. Um, and I can only imagine that being on a stage with 900 people uh, looking at you and someone peppering questions at you for an hour is exactly the way you wanted to spend the holiday. <laughs> I'd like to get started with a question I'm, I'm imagining many people have. Uh, two acclaimed novelists living under the same roof, for better or for worse, how do you do that? Uh, in terms of process, in terms of developing an idea, do you seek each other out? Do you make sure that you're at arm's length? Um, it's fascinating that you have someone who understands the process so perfectly right there and someone who understands you so perfectly. How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, we, we met in a, a Syracuse uh, writing program way back in, well, it's like 
it was a while ago. And, uh, and um, I think we, I, as I remember it, I was just, uh, we were, we had a lot of great times early just bonding over fiction. And I think over a common sense that um, fiction was there for a moral ethical purpose. Like it wasn't just this kind of frilly thing. We, it was, uh, we'd both lived quite a bit by that time. And I think we both agreed that fiction was a way to get to the heart of things, you know. So we kind of bonded over that early. And um, I know for me, Paula is just the, the person, you know, I do as much as I can on my own and I give it to her. And then there was a very tense afternoon where I leave <laughs> and wait. And if she, and in the past, if she says, yeah, then I'm screwed, you know. <laughs> but, but a couple, you know, if she reacts with a serious emotional reaction or like with Lincoln and the Bardo, I'd written a third of it and I was very unsure about it, really unsure about it gave it to her and she left a post-it note with the nicest thing anyone has ever said about my writing. That I, it's so nice I keep it secret actually. But that gave me the confidence to, to go ahead. So I, I mean, it's in, invaluable to have that kind of a, you know, someone who knows you and will say that ending is full of it, you know, or, <laughs> or, or it's beautiful. Yeah, and that's a really important thing to have in your, in your realm anyway. It might not be in your own home, but it's a wonderful thing to have it in your own home. You know, you have someone who you can really go to and say, is this legitimate? Am I saying something authentic here? Um, but I think our processes are very separate. Uh, we work very separately, and you know, often George won't show me anything he's worked on until it's really, really finished, and he really feels like it's finished. I'm a little more um, available to share things early <laughs> on um, because I think it won't. Maybe, maybe that's maybe the difference between. Um, the sensibility of, an, of someone who feels themselves as a novelist versus a short story writer. I don't feel like I have to have it perfectly clean to really um, benefit from someone's input. Oh, yeah, so, so I don't go over any ideas with him. I want my process to be my process. I'm really very kind of territorial about that. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm open to hear how other people read it. And there have even been times when I've read aloud to him a section that I thought was really working, and by reading it aloud, I would be like, well, wait a minute, don't even listen to this. It's really not working. Yeah, yeah. So I can go back, and so it's, it's helpful, and it's just kind of what we do. I find it fascinating that both of you coming from, uh, both of the books are so different from each other, and yet there are many connective moments um, that both of you chose as the springboard for your fiction the past, history. Uh, George, obviously you with uh, the evening in the cemetery, the sort of world historical figure of Abraham Lincoln, his son. And yet Paula, you also go back to what some might argue is a tougher history to research, which is the history of the self. Um, it's fascinating that, George, you aren't writing history. You aren't writing memoir. You need to have fiction to tell those stories. And why is history, why is the past so important as the jumping off point for the stories that you want to tell? Well, for me, for me um, that's always been my material because that's my family. And I am not someone who's very good at inventing. And a friend once uh, recently told me that Philip Roth had told her, don't invent, remember. And I thought that was just so fascinating because I really can't invent. I don't have that facility. But I have a, I have a real, um, and I think that my fiction is based on memory and it's based on autobiogra autobiography. But I was thinking about that as I was working just a few weeks ago and I thought, you know, this is not really memory. This is an idea I have about what happened in my life that I then build a memory around. So I have this kind of kernel and I kind of like build a memory and I build detail and I build scene and I build it in my mind and then I build it on the paper. But that's just the way that I work. So I don't have the inventive uh, faculty that George does. Yeah, but at, at what point do you then say, I'm departing? I'm departing from memory and saying now I, because having read your book, the creativity is clearly there. Those characters are real in their own ways. They are not just your family. At what point do you step away from that and say, now I'm bouncing? Um, that might be integral to this idea of 
don't invent, remember, because I remember these things. I remember they had, the things that happened in the book had a cause, but I might not remember exactly, or I might not have ever known exactly what the cause was. But then I think I'm using my, my mental facility to kind of look and say, what might have been the cause? What was probably the cause? And then develop that into memory. Uh, do you ever have an ethical dilemma as you're doing that? Uh, that you're jumping off from one place into something that will take you in a different area? No, because I know the story. Because I know the story. So I don't have the problem with where am I going here. I, I really know the story. I know it deeply because I take it from my experience. It's wonderful. Yeah. Now, George, in terms of turning to history as the springboard for you, um, I find it fascinating in the book, it, just structurally, that you allow history to speak for itself. Um, these wonderful pullaways that you have, where we get the voice in the characters themselves, but also in the actual historical documentation, America is almost speaking for itself. There's this panoply of voices. And did you have that in mind when you first conceived the book? No, I, you know, I love this idea that somebody said a novel is a long piece of prose with something wrong with it. <laughs> and, and I have gotten to the point now where you, you, know, you go into a work of fiction, I know there's a lot of writers in the audience, you think it's gonna be easy and perfect. And then you find out that it's got at least one fatal flaw, probably several. And if you're a beginner, you go, oh no, my idea sucks and I have to do something else. But with experience, I think you kind of go, okay, the, the problems in the work of fiction are, are what are gonna eventually make it wonderful. If you can just say, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity, or it's, a, um, it's just, it's gonna be a shared difficulty we have with the readers. So with this book, the one problem was Lincoln because nobody should write a book about Lincoln. There's so many already, you know? <laughs> so you have that problem where you first say, oh God, I gotta try to make that guy real. Well, then you kind of think, it's like Houdini, if I can make him real, that would be awesome, you know? Uh, and likewise with the history, it felt to me pr pretty, from pretty early on that the details of the, the, the boy's death and all were really important to the, to the story, but how to get it in there, you know? And I tried doing a kind of a mock Gore Vidal thing, that didn't work. I tried it in first person from Lincoln, that didn't work. So finally I thought, well, how do I know all that stuff? And the answer was, I just read those history books. And I had that little aha moment was myself saying, can I just put those in verbatim, like plagiarize a little bit? And you kind of go, well, it's my book, you know? <laughs> so, so, so that was it. So no, actually for me, none of it is planned out like thematically or, or, or anything like that. It's just, how do I solve the problems that I put in front of myself in a way that doesn't seem cliche? And then, you know, kind of being insistent on that then you find yourself all of a sudden stumbling into something you hadn't planned on doing. I, it's, uh, I was looking, as reading both of your books, I was trying to find those things that connect them as opposed to separate them, and one of them that jumped out at me was that you both have, uh, in the development of the characters, this seeking intimacy, that somehow both of the characters, are, or all of the characters and the main characters are seeking this kind of intimacy, and the reason they're doing that is uh, sort of a search for self-awareness. That self-awareness is the, the, the place that everyone is trying to get to. I'm thinking of that, I, I don't know if people have read the book, but that remarkable moment when all of the characters walk through Abraham Lincoln, and that's the, the moment that they are all aware of what they truly are and they can go on. In your book, there is the same sort of moment of translucence, and I, I don't want to impose that on you, but in uh, when the young ballet dancer is in Arizona, and she suddenly becomes aware of how she's not eating, how her body is, that she has to become intimately aware of the body itself before she can really understand who she is and how that relates to the relationship with the mother and so forth. Did you ever talk about that which seems to be overarching in both books. I mean, it's this magnificent thing. Did you ever talk about that? Well, I, I, I'm, when you were talking, something that occurred to me is that we uh, met all those years ago, and we, as I said, we both had kind of weird, in, maybe interesting lives before that, and came together. And I think, uh, so I've been hearing a lot of the stories that are in Paula's book since we were 28 years old. You know, and hearing them, and they, they were, and if one of the benefits of having a, a wonderful partner like Paul is, is that 
her moral view is so beautiful and sophisticated and honest that just by being around her, uh, I absorbed a lot of that. So a lot of the principles that I think are in her book, uh, you know, the, as you say, the desire for intimacy, but also the way that the world frustrates that in spite of itself, even people who are trying to give you intimacy can mess you up. That stuff I got into my head from the time we were in our 20s, just by osmosis with a wonderful mind. Uh, so I think it would be surprising if there weren't some overlaps, because in a sense, when you're married 31 years, you have a kind of a, a sort of a mind meld of sorts, you know, and I think we, we have the advantage, too, of having a bit of an artistic mind meld, as we described earlier, so I'm, I think you're right, yeah. But we also um, both have a similar thing in our childhoods, and that is that we were both really religious kids. Yeah, and so um, I was really religious, and George was really religious in the Catholic tradition. And I think we kind of, that was one of the things that kind of bound us together as a couple, even early on, even when neither of us were churchgoers at that time. But one of the first things we did, which is kind of strange to think about, but we were in graduate school, and one of the first things we decided to do was there was a church on the corner of the block where I lived, you know, we were pretty, like, we were, it was, what, the late 80s, we, we were, and we were older, but we thought, well, you know, let's go to church together. It was really one of the things that we wanted to do together. So um, we had that in yeah. common. And we kind of did it without be, irony. As human beings. You know, sorry. No, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, we weren't being ironic at yeah. all. <laughs> no, but I mean, but I mean, <laughs> not at no, all. I mean, that, that would be terrible. We were, yeah. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. We were being very sincere. Yeah, yeah. We were really looking, I think, each of us really looking for a spiritual life and for kind of self awareness and development in that way. And I think that that kind of common interest is as strong as the common interest we have in, in the, the, the kind of artistry of trying to be a writer. That's extraordinary to hear, uh, because reading both of your books, there is this spirituality that drives it, even in the way both of you begin. You both begin with a death. Oh, yeah. And it, it, it's a, you know, it may, I understand in George, your book, why you have to begin with the death, and not just one, but several deaths, Bevins, Bowman, and so forth. And already in those deaths, there is the hint of the intimacy. Both of them are seeking intimacy at the very moments of their death, which I find extraordinary. But Paula, almost more fascinating is that in a book that, you know, digs into your own background, is memoiric, you sort of begin at the end of the book. Was that, uh, did you know that before you dove in that that's what you were going to do and then it would shape the rest of the structure or did you discover that? Um, I discovered that actually. Um, actually, I um, wrote the entire book, and then I think I was almost finished with the book, and then my mother passed away. And that experience was so kind of strong for me that I went back and put that beginning, it's just a few pages in the first chapter, is called The End, and um, that was, a real, I really love that chapter, it's a really meaningful chapter for me, so... Yeah, that came late. And I think it shaped the whole thing. Once I had that first chapter in place, then I could shape the end and it made sense, you know, so. Did, did it make you go back and reshape certain moments within the book? Because you have these wonderful, um, it, it, George, you use history as sort of pullaways, those moments when history speaks for itself. It's a nice breath for us and the narrative and we can take a pause. But Paula, you have this uh, really wonderful, and it, it sometimes it's just a paragraph, maybe a paragraph and a half, where in this very intimate story about the life of a family and the coming of age story, we get a much broader perspective on how it's all gonna work out. You touch on a, the brother's life, you touch on the father's life. Were those already in place, or were those influenced by the bringing the death of the mother in early? Um, no, those were organic to the writing. Those were organic to the writing of the book. And, you know, those kinds of things you wonder as you go along your writing, and all of a sudden you realize you've come to a place where you have something in the book that, that you know, it, it makes sense to you, but for, for it to make sense to anyone else. And also your understanding of it isn't tempered by linear time. It's not tempered by past, present, and future. Your understanding of it is much more holistic because, you know, you understand the whole picture. So to get the reader into that same place, then you 
at least this is what I did just naturally. I just wanted to put in that paragraph, like, okay, and, and many years later, da, 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 and then we can move on, because it gives the understanding, well, so then you're writing like that, and you're like, well, that probably isn't going to work. But for right now, I like it, and it's working, and so you go on, and there are many places where that needs to happen in the narrative, and um, so that happened very organically and was always there. Uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, it's happening organically and these are, you know, they don't feel intrusive at all. Uh, in either book, these moments, do you have an internal rhythm while you're writing? Do you have a sense, a pacing that allows you to know, now I'm going to come back, now I'm going to go in. How, did it take a long time to develop that or is that just something natural, organic? Well, I, I don't know. The way that I tend to work is, I was talking to somebody before, I just pretend there's a meter in your head, this is positive, this is negative. And when you're rereading your own work, your whole job is to try to be very honest about what that needle's doing. So you're reading along, yesterday it was perfect, all of a sudden it goes down in the negative. That's the moment of truth. Because most people say, oh, I'm just wrong today. Or it was great yesterday, I'm gonna ignore it. But I think what you train yourself to do is go, all right, so I'm on page eight, the needle's in the negative, what do I do? And then I think you look what I do is look very honestly and say, you can change anything you want. Is there anything you could change on that that would make the needle inflect positively? Then if you do that, that's called revising. So I think a lot of these, these decisions, they're, intu they're intuitive, but you're basically just pretending that you're the, uh, a first-time reader. And what, if I had never read this book, if I picked it up on the bus, how would I react to this? And I think for me, the whole process of learning to write has just been to, one, understand that there's always that opinion going on when you're reading and two, get in better contact with it and trust it. Even if it's telling you bad news, it's probably right, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and organic, I don't mean by organic like a first time writing, of course. I mean yeah, organic really by like, you know, many, 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 many revisions and finding what your voice wants to be. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is like, you know, there'll be often times when George will read something I have and I'll say, yeah, this isn't working here. He's like, well, cut it. I'm like, yeah, no, George, I'm not going to cut it. <laughs> I'm actually going to use it because it needs to be there, but I need to figure it out, you know, like that. So, yeah. you know, so there's all that kind of stuff that goes on, but, but he's a big yeah, cutter. A big he cutter. loves to cut. And cut, we cut, had, cut. Well, when we were in Syracuse, we, our, our kids were in a school, a private school, and we were always struggling to get the money. So I had this long story called Pastorelia that was too long. Uh, and so I thought, and also I, I just didn't know, I, I was feeling it was too silly. So I went through and I cut all the merely funny bits out of it, thinking I was being such a great technician, you know, Mr. Minimal. And I gave it to Paula and she's like, uh, it's pretty good, but you cut all the good stuff out of it. <laughs> and, you know, and this is often when you, you, know, you get advice from, advice from your loved one. You, the first movement is to go, why did I give it to her? Oh, you know. <laughs> but now I've learned that I, she's right. So then I just went and I put all the funny stuff back in and then, then we sold it. So I, so I definitely have in our house the reputation of being a bit severe on the cutting. <laughs> yeah. And when you sit down every morning to write, the process, do you go back, do you fiddle, make sure the needle is at least close to where it needs to be? Uh, I mean, how do yeah, you do usually that? If I'm writing a story, I'll just start from, even with Lincoln, a lot of days I started from page one and read the whole thing. And just waiting to see, like trying to get in that perfect mindset where you're not too attached to it, you're not too averse, just, uh, and even making a little mental, mental note, like I'm feeling grouchy, I'm going to be a little harsh today, okay? And then just putting in marginal notes. And at some point, usually when I get to where it's a little unformed, it gets so out of whack that I just, you know, go back to the beginning and put in the changes. But yeah, yeah, like that. And it's really interesting what a mental game it is, you know, because like the most important thing, like George is saying, as far as my hearing of it, is the mindset you come to it with because it changes with every mindset. It's a really like a mental exercise to sit down and try to read something you've written with a fresh mind. That's like the thing. If you can do that, you can write anything you want. You know, you just have to be able to read it with a fresh mind. And um, so, yeah, that's really important. And I think, I don't know if you agree, but I feel like most people who uh, are, are, say are beginning writers, and, and certainly when I was starting out, I had a, a wrong idea about how much intentionality you had to have. In other words, I, I, my theme is this, and I'm gonna try to show this. And for me, the big breakthrough was when I realized, for me, I'm much better off not having any idea what I'm trying to tell anybody. <laughs> Just go in and try to make some fun. And if you're having fun, the reader will have fun. And all that other stuff that, we, that scares the hell out of us from grade school, theme and character and politics, 
that will all come out naturally. You know, if, you, if I can make you read 200 pages of my book, I promise you, if you stick with it, it of course it has theme, of course it has characters. Uh, I had an um, editor at the New Yorker named Bill Buford, and he gave me this incredible Zen advice one time. I sold the story to them, and they took a really long time publishing it, and then it, he was cutting it to bits, you know, and every time he talked to me, he had some new idea. So finally, fishing for a compliment, I said, uh, so Bill, what do you like about the story? And uh, he was a really quiet guy, and he said, um, he said well, uh, I read a line, and I like it, enough to read the next. <laughs> that was it. That, but, that's, that was, but that's every reader. Yeah, that I was mean, the entire New Yorker mindset was that, exactly, you know, so that's... But deep. anybody can t close the book at any moment. Yeah. I mean, you're almost doing that sentence to sentence to sentence. I think we might disagree a little, at least in approach, in terms of intentionality. I, I mean, not as a cage, yeah. not as a cage uh -huh. intention, but having some sense of, I mean, as Paula said, you knew where the story was going. You knew where you wanted to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that's at least my approach, but mm -hmm. um, this idea of the freedom, but as long as you have a sense of, do you have a sense of structure? Do I think you, you guys are, I would say you guys are real novelists. I wrote something with a lot of white yeah, yeah, space, yeah, yeah, yeah. with a lot of white space. But, so I think with, my method is a short story method, I think. I, I can certainly see where if you're gonna write a novel, you do have to have some arc in mind or something like that. I well, it's just, true. I like to know where I'm going. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, otherwise I'd be completely insecure, but. But for you, do you do have, because you're digging in from the memories, you do know where it's going. Um, I do. I know where it's going in general. I yeah. don't know where it's going specifically. Correct. Yeah. So, like, and for me, like, if I can find, if I can find along the way, which I'm working on another project now, and if, if I could find the ending, if I could find the ending, it would be so helpful, but I'm just not, I'm not there. So I'm just, you know, kind of grinding around through the beginning, trying to get a flavor of this and where it's going to go. But, um, so I know the, the, the overarching story and that's, yeah, that's all I know. But the detours are always the most fun. Just on the days where you're going to be a grouch, wherever you say, oh, screw it, I'm going over here and let's see what happens. Uh, have you ever hit a moment where you're having too much fun going off in a direction? Yeah, yeah I have a whole file called, you know, title cuts. <laughs> title yeah. cuts. I just, you know, put the title of my book and cuts and the, all my cuts go in there and sometimes it's pages and pages and pages. Do you ever go back and try and bring them I, back I in? I do sometimes, but I haven't succeeded at that yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I mean, for me, the whole model is that you're, tr you know, you've got an imaginary reader there, and the question is, what do you think of her? And if, you know, when you're a young writer, you think she's dumb, and she wants to worship you if you're smart enough and clever enough, and if you can just pull up the manure truck with your ideas and dump it on her, she's going to be grateful. <laughs> and then as you mature, you go, oh, no, actually, we have to be in an intimate relationship where I... I I'm going to assume that she is as smart as I am, as worldly, as well-intentioned, and then all of your editing decisions are made to honor that person. So it's like if you were on a date with somebody and you pulled out the index cards and said, 7 p.m., ask about her mother, you know, there's, <laughs> you feel the condescension in that, and I think having, too, for me, having too rigid of a plan is that. But likewise, for me, as somebody who likes to be funny, I can sometimes use that as a defense and so there will be sections where, oh, pretty funny, but meanwhile, I've totally turned my back on the reader because I'm just performing my funniness. And for me, those are the sections that get cut where, you know, you're just phoning it in, essentially. You know? And I want to say one more thing about this intentionality thing. Because I'm working from my own life and from the memories I have of growing up, um, I had, like, two words on my bulletin board next to my desk, and the first one was listen because I really have to not get pulled off by um, something that just kind of comes out of the energy of what I'm doing. I have to kind of listen to what needs to be in the story and I have to really open myself when I'm working in that way. So it's a different kind of thing. It's kind of more, I have to open myself to what needs to be said and what, needs, what I need to follow. And then the other word I had was benefit, because I think these are really difficult stories that, that I deal with anyway. And there are a lot of people who I love who are involved, and there are also a lot of people I think of as, you know, possible readers or people who would 
enter this story by, by reading it, participating that way. And there needs, in my vision, what I hope for is some benefit that comes through my retelling and reshaping of this material into kind of our culture and our minds that creates some kind of benefit. So those are the two things that I kind of use as guiding principles in this overarching intention of what I'm trying to do. I think that's a lovely way of putting it. I mean, it combines the idea of having respect for the reader because you want to give something to the reader. And is that the way then, uh, and I agree, going in thinking about overarching themes and all of that is problematic because no one sits down to write a novel and go, ah, today I'm writing about betrayal, here I go. Um, is that how then those larger ideas do bubble to the surface? Um, on their own because you have these other motivating factors going on. Yeah. I think so, yes. Yeah, I think your intention sitting down is everything. So like for me, I mean, at least for me, I work on my craft, you know? You work on your ability to write and your ability to hear sentences and your ability to write a sentence and read it and understand whether or not you want it to stay or to change or how, or where it fits, how it works. So you work on your craft in that way, but then you need, I think, to develop your intention of what you, what you are trying to, and I don't think you need to know, but just that you're trying to share something positive. And for me, it comes out of things that were negative, you know, things that were very difficult, then to share something that we can all kind of understand. Um, that's important. I think, too, that part of, for me, the, the journey was to, um have to find out that the things that I actually used to get through every day were the things I was going to write with because I was from a working class background and so I thought the first thing I have to do with this guy is get him out of the way because he's stupid you know he's a pop culture guy he hasn't read enough get him out and get somebody fancy in there and then over the years uh, you know of course you realize that you you only have the gifts you have and even if they're mixed gifts or you see them as detriments that's what you're gonna, you can't write 300 pages of fakery, you know, you have to. So for me, it was kind of saying, I'm actually pretty sentimental uh, and also kind of too sarcastic. And then finally realizing when, when the kids were little, uh, that's what you've got. You know, you, I'm gonna have to be funny and a little bit sarcastic and I'm also, I've got a dark imagination. So that kind of giddy breakthrough where you go, oh God, I'm not gonna be as good as my heroes, uh, but if I, if I, if I'm just myself, I might be able to play in the, it's almost like if you had this, you know, this dog that you trained to go get a pheasant, the, the dog that is your talent, go boy, go. And he runs out and he comes back with a, like the lower half of a Barbie doll. You're like, what? <laughs> that's my book, you know? But at the same time, you're like, yeah, that's my book. You know, <laughs> so, so, I, so I tell my students, you know, that there's a bittersweet moment where you, you have been trying to stand on the hill where your hero is, whether it's Toni Morrison or Hemi or whatever, and you've, been plotting up that hill imitatively all these years, and there's that magic, bittersweet moment when you realize that the things you know, one, are real, and two, they're weird, and they're private, and you can't get to those things in somebody else's voice. And then you walk off Hemingway Mountain, and over here is Saunders shit hill, and you, you know, you, you stand on that, oh God, this is it. But that's a sweet moment, but it's also sad, you know, in a way that you're. Yeah, that kind of makes me want to, you know, mention kind of the idea of where George and I are both from, which is what something we both really share. Um, you know, my, my editor, I went out to lunch with her. It was a big moment for me, and I'm older, and I had my first book, so it's very exciting. So my editor takes me out, and she's like, you know, we're kind of the same, because, you know, you're from kind of rural South Dakota, and I'm kind of from rural Pennsylvania. And I'm like, oh, well, that's cool. And she's like, yeah. And so I said, well, you know, what did your... What are your parents like? She's like, well, my dad's a judge, my mom's a lawyer, my grandfather, you know, my grandfather's a senator. I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> I go like, I go cattle man all the way back through like the generations and road grader. You know, that was my other grandfather who was wonderful. You know, it's, these are wonderful jobs, but working class, really working class people, um, traders and, and laborers and George's family too. So we don't, I, I was the first one in my family to go to college, um, and I don't know, I think you were too, yeah. approximately. So, you know, we don't come from like a, um, a lineage, an intellectual lineage. So we have to discover our talents where we can find them. But, but it's one thing to, you know, 
to have the inclination to discover the talents. It's another thing to actually find them. So uh, I, we only have five minutes left before we open up for the questions. I would love to end on just a process question. We've talked about being able to let go and have, you know, uh, if the intention is there, if there is the freedom. Do you have, uh, sort of as in poker, you know, a tell while you're writing, while you're in it, while you're deep into the work, um, where you know maybe, uh, you know, you have to look up to see the, 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 the arrow going. You have to look up and say, am I giving benefit here? You can be too deep into it to know that you're maybe not. Do you have mechanisms that you force yourself to keep yourself honest to know that you're on the right track? Do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't it? do interviews. No, That's no, the but, first but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I hum. Yeah. I, I read everything out loud to myself, and if I'm reading along and she said, well, I don't think, and as soon as I hear myself humming, oh. my dog comes in the room, huh. and I see the dog, and I hear the hum, and I go, this is crap, and so really? I have oh, to, wow. it's great. very helpful. That's great. That's great. I had to train the dog. But yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. No, but I'm just saying, do, do you have something like that that, well, that allows the have, triggers? I have an inner nun, and the inner nun Sort of, no, I mean, I, I make the joke, but it's true. I I'm, uh, have been home working now since Christmas, but kind of the longest stretch of uninterrupted work for a while, and after traveling too much, and I could see my standards coming back in, you know? So when I had the story I'm working on, when I first read it at Christmas, I'm like, yeah, pretty good, good enough. Then every day, I'm like, ooh, not good enough, not good enough. There's a corner that I turn where instead of feeling like, oh, I hope it's good enough, or it's probably good enough, I feel like, oh, I can't wait to send this. Just a little turn, uh, and, and then usually it's not the whole story. I, I feel that way about parts. And then slowly, like, you know, actually, I could live with up to page eight. I would love for somebody to read this. And then you get to the end, and there's a fussy period at the very end, like we, I just went through it. But a feeling of joy, like, ah, it's going to be so fun to show this to somebody. Then, then I know that I'm, you know, probably not always right, though. Sometimes you feel that way and you're incorrect. But I think that's the first feeling is like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited about about this, and, I'm, and if someone doesn't like this, they're so stupid, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Well, I haven't thought about it before, but I think that if I, if I were to say, I read out loud a lot, too, and um, I think that when it feels to me, I, I have two different feelings when I'm writing. One is that I'm like a painter. I feel very much like a painter when I'm writing. So, and the other thing is the, the sound of the language. I very much love, like, the sound of language. So when it feels like the music's right and the colors and the tones are right, then I feel happy. You know, they, I heard somewhere that, that, not to be drop a big literary reference, but the band Van Halen, uh, <laughs> they used to have a thing called the brown sound. And they would say, Eddie, how do you know the mix is right? He goes, I don't know, man. It's just like the brown sound. And I think that, you know, the, you, it's... Um, Sound is so important to writers, and I, I don't hear it talked about very often. Like, how, how do you know? It just sounds right. And yeah, that's nice. Well, I think that's a lovely place for us uh, <laughs> to, to pause and to open up the, uh, the, the room for questions. And I think, Bo, you're going to... Turn up the lights, and we have some people in the audience with microphones. So if you have a question and you stand, they'll give you a microphone. Remember, we're going to get as many questions in as we can, and please don't tell a story. So who wants to go first? I'd like to just say what a great interviewer David is. Yeah. He's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, I'm sorry, God, I don't know if I your name wrong. <laughs> I heard there were two words at your desk. One of them was listen, and I wanted to know what the other one was. Um, the other word was benefit. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure, you're welcome. This is a very special evening for me. This thing started 12 years ago in this very room. 
We had about half the ground floor filled, filled at the time. It has grown beautifully under its current management. I couldn't be happier. I've got to ask you, though, I, I take it from what you've said, you don't write from outline. I, I don't personally. But no, I don't either. Yeah. John, uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the great courtroom dramatist wrote a literary book to begin with. It didn't sell, and so he started writing on a dependable formula that bought him a jet. I take it you haven't been uh, having a jet from no. your art. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and you know, I, I teach at Syracuse, and one of the things we, I always say is that there are, um, for every writer, there's a different method. So if you, if you go and hear writers talk about a method, I think what you do is you say, to what extent is that method helpful to me? There's, there isn't any one you know, one size fits all. I think it's just, you have to, and I mean, that's the terrible part is you have to find your own method. And that's lonely, you know, I think. Yeah. Do you have a story about getting the MacArthur grant and what that was all about? What was, what was it like to have all that money just dumped on you? <laughs> Actually, yeah, I, I was doing a, a nonfiction piece uh, where I was driving the whole Mexican border, and I got an email, and I stayed overnight with these Minutemen guys, like, uh, on the border. We were doing a stakeout. Uh, and um, then I got to my email, and it said, from Paul, it said, honey, call me, call me, call me, call me. <laughs> and so I called, and she said, I don't know, this guy from the MacArthur's been calling. I don't know. I don't know. And uh, so I couldn't call him until the next morning. So I just all night, like, oh, my God, could this, you know. Uh, and I had a dream, and a nun actually came, and she said, <laughs> and, she, and, and the nun, and the nun, the dream, the nun said, uh, oh, Mr. Saunders, you think you're going to get a MacArthur fellowship? <laughs> like, no, no, I don't. So, so, but, yeah, that was, that's what I remember. But. Yeah, the only thing I remember from that is the next day my daughter and I went down to a jewelry store, and we bought ourselves rings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, we bought ourselves rings, and we called them our genius rings. <laughs> Uh, I just want your personal opinion. What do you think is the line between artistry and commercialism? Basically, what I'm trying to ask is, when you're writing something, how do you pretty much make sure that everything you believe is perfect, every, all your syntax is correct, all your prose as well, all your flow is perfect as you want to be, but ultimately it won't sell, and how do you have that line between what do you, are you actually proud in and what do you believe will actually make us successful for you? Thank you. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'll let George answer this one, but I, I, I wish I knew. Um, yeah, it, it took me a long, long time to get this um, first book out, and, you know, now I'm trying to write a second one, and I think it, it doesn't, my, my question in my own work is not like, is it going to sell? That's never my question. My question is, am I writing what I need to be writing, and am, is it moving forward in the ways that I want it to go? But, but that's a big question. Yeah, I have to turn it to George. Yeah, you know, the, uh, Frank Conroy came to Syracuse once to talk to our students, a great memoirist, and he drew this big arc on the board, and he put a W at one end for writer and R for reader on the other side. And he goes, okay, every book is somewhere on this arc. So the w, if it's close to the W, it's a book for only the writer. So Self-referential, difficult, blocking people out. R is your most popular, you know, uh, airport book that anybody can read and enjoy. He said, now you think I'm going to tell you to put your X right in the middle. He said, all I want you to do is decide where your X is. If, if you want to write a book that's harder than Ulysses that nobody can read except your mother and even she gets irritated, <laughs> you, you can. There's no problem with that. Only just don't do that and complain about sales. You know? And likewise, if you write a book that sells a gazillion copies so easy, don't complain that you don't get the critical thing. So I think that's part of it is to say for you, where do I want to be? My working assumption is if I write a book that pleases me artistically, it will sell. I don't know that that's true, but I like to think that. And I think a, a lot of fiction is you're gaming yourself so that you can write another book. So if I say to myself, oh, I have to worry about sales versus art, I freeze up. Whereas if I say, no, there's no distinction. I'm going to write the most beautiful book. It's going to sell the most. And then, you know, from there, yeah. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I just wondered if you could explain a little bit about the relationship with your editor, publisher, and how that goes in the process of writing. 
Well, I have worked with uh, Deborah Treisman at The New Yorker for a lot of years, and then Andy Ward at Random House. And basically, I think it's, uh, I just feel like I'm lucky because I trust both of them 100%. So um, it's, it's, you know, I think it's perfect. And this will be the one where there's finally no edits. And you send it, and you get the edits back, and you're like, oh, no, they've lost their judgment, <laughs> you know? And, and then, after, then you start looking at the comments. I always just, like, just look at the first comment. And usually you look at the first one like, yeah, that makes sense. And then, so I think the trick is if you have an editor that you really trust, then it's just, it's great. It's a great benefit because somebody is on your side and they're trying to get you to do what you think you've already done and they're helping you. So, you know, that's the best. And case. I've never worked with a magazine editor, so I don't really know how that goes. But with my um, editor for my novel at Random House, she was someone who just really liked my work, and I, that was really um, a blessing for me. That was huge. And so I didn't get too much editing um, with her. Actually, it was when the book went to the copy editor that I got a lot of editing notes back, and that's when my work in, in rewriting really started. Um, so it was a little different, though I've heard that other writers, like Jonathan Franzen kind of... Um, I'm sure he doesn't have the copy editing work I did because he's like such a, a grammar perfectionist. But um, <laughs> but I had a lot of copy editing work, and um, but he he explained the same kind of relationship with his editor. It was just someone who really really likes his work, so that's nice. I mean, uh, the the best comment I ever had was one of my editors, Sarah Crichton at FSG, and she basically, at one point, she had asked me to do something, and I said, well, what do you think about this, and should I try this? And she said, you're a much better writer than I am. I'm a much better editor than you are, so trust me. <laughs> and you have to know your wheelhouse. I mean, it's the same thing. Where are you on that spectrum? And recognize that you have to trust them. Yeah. That's, that's why they're really good at what they do. I just wondered if you've considered writing a book of fiction concerning the operation of the current U.S. government. <laughs> How can you fictionalize yeah. this? Yeah. Uh, well, you, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you, let me give you a high-minded answer, uh, which is that I think I, I, since this, the recent events, um, I'm more convinced of the value of events like this and of the, uh, the power of fiction. And the reason is when you read a, a work of fiction, you're just being reminded by a friendly author that you have the capacity to imagine other people in three dimensions. And you have, yeah. yeah. And, and you're being reminded that what we do, all of us do automatically, is make false, simplistic projections about other people. You know, when somebody cuts you off in traffic, you always know what political party they belong to. <laughs> so I think the value of what we do is just that for a couple hours a day, you're just reminded that you're in a container that is yourself and your habits. And the author is saying, you know, actually, you, you're bigger than that. You can imagine beyond your own boundaries, you know. So that's. Thank you very much. I'm interested in the aspect of um, coming as an educator. As an educator, you have students that are coming. Are you seeing a trend? We, we have a, a very difficult task as teachers to teach children and young adults that it's OK to rewrite. It's OK to do a rough draft. It's okay to go back and make those changes. What are you seeing at Syracuse? What are you seeing? Do they have imaginations? Because my, my children and my high school schoolers, when I taught them, Mrs. St. John, I just can't. I have no ideas. Even when you go through brainstorming, even when you go through the process of writing and you're, so how is it going in Syracuse? What, are, what kind of kids are you getting? What kind of young adults? Are they coming in as writers? Or are you having to start in the beginning? Right. Well, we have a special case there because at Syracuse, I teach in the creative writing program. It's an MFA program. So we get about 650 applications a year for six places. And they're fully funded, 100% funded, and they get $20,000 a year. So the people we get are already great. And they're, yeah, so our job is just to make them more like themselves, really. 
But I, I think that the trick of rewriting is that nobody has an idea. There's no good idea for fiction. That whatever idea you have, it could be either good or bad. But so I think the great superpower of rewriting is you never have to have writer's block. You just write down any old thing, and then if you bring your mind to it the way you've been talking about, where you just say, well, do I like that or not? If not, why not? You can fix, you can tweak it, and then suddenly an idea that was lame or sort of flat can become more interesting with you know, revisions. I think that's, you know. I mean, I, 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 people who don't rewrite are not really, they're kind of like just playing, I think, you know, I think.